Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and today we continue in the Gospel of John, chapter 13. Now before we get started, as always, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we have given ourselves over to the control of the Holy Spirit who indwells us. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and everything you provided so that we can study your word today. We ask that our hearts and our minds be open and ready to receive your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 13 begins Jesus with his disciples. Uh, this is the idea that He's moved away from the public, he's moved away from the crowds, and he'll be doing his teaching with his disciples. In the first part of chapter 13, he's going to teach by example. And in this chapter, we have one of the most famous examples by Jesus when he washed the feet of his disciples. It's only a couple of days now before the cross when we come to this point in John. Verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come that he would depart out of this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now this is just before the Passover, which is actually uh, within hours away. Uh, this tells us that Jesus was thinking a couple of things during this time before the Passover came. Two points. Jesus knew that his time to go to be with the Father was very short. It was starting to approach. And that he would be with the Father exalted in heaven. But of course first he had to go through the cross. The second thought is one that we want to pay, to pay uh, special attention to that it shows us that though he would depart out of this world to the Father, the ones he loved would stay in the world for a while. In other words, he was going to leave them, but the main thing we see here is how much he loved those he was going to have to leave. It says he loved them to the end. Uh, this has a couple of meanings, to the end, up to the time he was going to have to leave them. And to the end also can mean to the utmost, how much he loved them so much. To the maximum, you might say. He loved them to the maximum. Jesus loved his disciples that he is going to have to leave. Uh, he wasn't going to leave them alone. We know that later he sends them the Holy Spirit. But the emphasis here is how much Jesus loves his own, his own sheep these disciples, these believers who have been faithfully following him, trying to learn, he was going to have to leave them behind in the world. And this verse tells us he loves them up to the moment he has to leave them and that he loves them to the extreme. Three points from this verse. Let's just go over them. One, these are the things Jesus is thinking of shortly before the Passover. Now, though the Passover is going to start soon, at the same time, we need to remember, he's going to be on the cross real soon. The second thought first, or I should say the first thought is, it's almost time for Jesus to leave this world and go to the Father. And then the second thought, Jesus loves his own, and he will love them up to the end, to his departure, to be with the Father. And this is the highest possible love. And don't ever forget, Jesus loves you with the highest possible love. Verse 2 gets us to the evening meal. What we often and is famously called the last 
Supper. Okay? Verse 2. During the evening meal, the devil had already put in his own heart that Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, to betray Jesus. So by the time of this evening meal, which would be on a Thursday night, the devil was already working on the heart of Judas Iscariot. It says the devil had already put in his own heart, that's the devil, the devil had put in his own heart, in other words, the devil's thinking this, that he's going to get Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. Now this evening meal is what we call the Passover meal also. That's a Jewish tradition where they eat a lamb um, on the evening of the Passover. In our understanding, it would be a Thursday. Let me get your timeline up here. This one I pre-prepared for you. The Old Testament calls for it to start on the uh, eve of the twilight of uh, the 14th of the month. Now, they didn't keep months like we do today. But ours would be Thursday evening. All right, Thursday evening. Of course, our days start at 12 a.m. in the morning, right? So what I've done here, I put the time it would be, and then in blue would we consider it. So though the Passover started, would be our Thursday night. To them, it would be beginning of the Passover, we'd say their Friday. So I tried to avoid some of the confusion here, but let's just look at it. So it's Thursday evening, it's past 6 p.m. They have the Passover meal. That's what's going on right now in our story. By 9 o'clock the next morning, it'd be the crucifixion. He'd be on the cross. So a lot's going to happen between this meal and the crucifixion at 9 o'clock. The crucifixion will last till 3 p.m. in the afternoon. They'll take him off the cross and they'll put him in the tomb before the Sabbath starts. So he would be in the tomb on that Friday, part of that Friday, all night Saturday, and then part of Sunday morning to we get to the resurrection. But you can see here that uh, Jesus is very close to the cross. Well, now let's look at our verse again and interpret it a little bit more. Verse 2, during the evening meal, the devil had already put in his own heart that Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, to betray Jesus. The devil is putting into his own heart, his thoughts is, to get Judas to betray Jesus. They're both involved in this conspiring to set up Jesus to be betrayed. Now think of it. We've already learned that Judas was greedy, right? He's disloyal. Let's write down Judas. Keep him in mind. We know he's greedy. He loves to steal from the treasury. Since he was a treasurer, it made it easy for him to do. He was disloyal to Jesus. He was unfaithful. We're going to see that in the portrayal, especially. And he was still an unbeliever. So this was just the perfect person for the devil, who is also Satan, to use to get his plan to work. Now we would expect the devil to take advantage of this type of person, greedy, thieving. Uh, his sin nature was running, running uh, kind of wild here. And... The devil's going to use this person already conditioned to betray Jesus. Now, it might be hard to imagine that anyone who could be with Jesus for some three years, uh, listening to what he said, uh, watching miracle after miracle, just being around Jesus and his, his attitude towards things, his actions, the peace that he had about him, and then the way he spoke up to the religious people. 
but to imagine anyone to continue to reject him as the Messiah and having all that exposure to Jesus. But that teaches us something. You remember the Pharaoh? Miracle after miracle was done right in front of him. He didn't accept the power and authority of God. He wouldn't listen to God, even though Moses kept showing up on his doorstep time and time again, miracle after miracle. And then even after he saw all his men, soldiers, and army die in the sea, he still didn't turn to God. But it just shows us again and again, God wants the heart right with him. That's what he expects. That's what he wants. This tells us two important things. God allows everyone to choose. He didn't make Judas follow him. He didn't make Judas obey him. He didn't make Judas believe in him. That's what we call there's no coercion. There's no force. That's what that means, coercion. Secondly, it's not how much truth or how it's presented or how it's said or even demonstrated in such things as assigned miracles. It is the person's heart that has to change. You might say that even if we try to pound the truth into somebody, really forceful, they still have to just choose. They just have to say in their heart that they want the truth. They want to know God. They want to know Christ. So you can give the gospel to them a hundred times or just once. It's still a matter of their choice. In verse 3, John reminds us more of what Jesus knew what was going to go on here. Verse 3 Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and he was going back to God. Now, there's some interesting things here if you think about it. Jesus knew that the Father had given him all things. That means Jesus is Lord. He's sovereign over the universe. Do you get that? He's God still. He doesn't stop being God, but he's also man. But as the God-man, he was going to have all things under his authority real soon. And even right now, he was still God. He was still sovereign. So we see John giving us some insight into Jesus' thinking as he's about to do something. Let me say that again. John is give us, giving us some insight into Jesus' thinking as Jesus is about to act. When it says Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, Jesus had all things under his control. But at the same time, he's submitting to the Father. And a big part of that plan, and doing what the Father wants, that he had come from God and is going back to God. He come from God into the uh, Virgin Mary, born a child in a manger. And then he would go back to God. That's the front and the back end, isn't it? The beginning and the end on him as him on earth as the God man. So that covers that whole time period. Jesus knew. He had followed the God, God the Father's plan that he is going to have all things under his feet soon. But at the same time, as God, he was still in control. Pretty soon he would be at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And this happened some 40 days after the resurrection. Okay? So we have the cross. His death and burial in the tomb, his resurrection. He walks the earth 40 days after a period of 30 days, the Bible says. Then he will ascend into heaven to be at the right hand of the Father. 
Jesus is going to have a short ministry in this 40 days. He's going to teach some more, and we have a, some of that teaching in our Bible. So we're reminded here that Jesus knows he's given all things by the Father, which makes him sovereign. He was sovereign as God, but now as the God-man, he's going to be sovereign. Now listen to this. Right after he mentions the fact that Jesus has all things, what is Jesus going to do? We go into this foot-washing understanding that Jesus Christ is the sovereign Lord. Verse 4. He, referring to Jesus, got up from the meal and put aside his garments and taking a towel, he wrapped it around himself. So Jesus got up from the table, took off, off his outer garments, that would be his, his, his cloak that he'd throw around perhaps his, his shoulders and the, and the outer uh, robe type of thing he, he wore, wrapped a towel around his waist to have it there in order to dry the feet he was about to wash. So now he's wrapping himself up like a servant would. Verse 5. Then he poured water into the basin, that's like a bowl, and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel he had wrapped around himself. Now we've learned that when a person cares for someone else's feet, that it's an act of a slave or a servant. We are reminded of John the Baptist who said he was unworthy to untie the sandal straps of the one coming after him. So to wash another's feet, understand now, is the act of a servant. Jesus is going to serve his disciples. Now picture this. Our sovereign Lord is doing service for his disciples. He's still their leader. He's still their Lord. But he's going to show an example of what we call, let me write the word up here, servanthood. Servanthood. Leadership through servanthood. That's one thing that's taught here. Then when Jesus got up and started to do this, this shocked his disciples. Here is the one they've been calling rabbi and teacher. It's a word for teacher, basically. Their leader, their Lord, starting to wash their dirty feet. Well, pretty soon, Jesus is going to do something much, much greater for them, and that is go to the cross. Well, do the great service of dying for the sins of the world, including the disciples, of course. And think of it. He also washed the feet of Judas, who's going to betray him. Jesus came to this earth willing to serve. And by this one example, he shows his disciples they too are to serve others. Listen to Philippians 2, 6, and 7. Who, although he existed in the form of God, talking about Jesus, as the God-man, as the Son of God, he was in the form of God, did not regard as equality with God as something to be held on to, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave, being made in the likeness of man and found in the appearance of man. So basically what this is saying, as God the Son, he was God. He left the throne room of heaven, took on flesh, willing to voluntarily be a slave of mankind and go to the cross. He became a man. He looked like a man. And he went to the cross as a man. As God, as man, as the God-man. 
So Jesus comes up to Peter. And as we might expect, Peter speaks up. Then he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Let me put this in a little better English. Are you going to wash, are you going to wash my feet? Now the other disciples just sat silent. Perhaps they were too stunned to say anything. But Peter speaks up. This is somewhat of a protest by Peter. This does not fit what a rabbi would do. The Lord would do. But we see Peter thinking in terms of human viewpoint. How the world sees things. The world did not expect a rabbi to wash the feet of their followers, nor slaves the feet of their masters. This is unheard of. So Jesus is turning things upside down in what we call the social order. But Jesus is doing something. He's teaching by example. He is showing them what they are to do. And Peter's not getting it. Not at all. The other disciples didn't get it. Verse 7 helps explain why they didn't get it. Jesus answered and said to him, speaking to Peter, What I do you do not understand now, but you will understand after these things. So Jesus tells Peter, you don't know what I'm doing. I understand that. You, you should understand that you're going to understand it later. All right, let me say that again, though a little different way. Jesus is saying, you don't understand this, but later on you will. After some things happen, these things happen. These things would be the events of this week, including the cross, the burial, the resurrection. And then later on they get the Holy Spirit that will help clarify these things in their mind. So later on, they will understand. In fact, Peter uh, will write some things showing his understanding. But let's go on and listen to what Peter says to Jesus. Jesus tells him, you're not going to understand. Then Peter comes back and says, and Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. This is a strong negative in the original Greek language. No, not ever. You're never, ever going to wash my feet. Now listen to Jesus. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Now this is quite a statement. So let's talk about it for a moment. I'm going to, I'm going to put that up there just by itself. If I do not wash you, Jesus is speaking to Peter, you have no share with me. There's something that they will not share if Jesus doesn't wash them. And now he's saying to Peter, if I don't wash you, you have no share with me. Now, let's talk about this. The washing has to do with what happens to a person when he becomes a believer. He is cleansed of his sins. All right? We call that regeneration. Regenerational warning. Regeneration means, well, we might say born again. <clears throat> All right? So, he's saying, if I don't wash you. So, what, say, what Jesus is saying is, this is a symbol for me saving you. A symbol for me. Uh, the Spirit does it. Regenerates a person through the washing and cleansing from sin. If this doesn't happen, you have no share with me. What share is he talking about? Well, when we say something like that, we might say, well, you know, if you don't do that, you're not going to be with me on this. You're not going to have any part of this with me if you don't do what I tell you. So that's kind of what Jesus is saying. If he doesn't go along and understand this is his washing, by that, the symbol of his regeneration. In other words, if you're not regenerated, you have no part with me. 
that part or that share would be the things in the kingdom of God and all the benefits and blessings that come with it. In other words, and let me say this clearly, if there is no regeneration cleansing, which Jesus' foot washing is symbolizing, okay? The foot washing symbolizes, I'm going to write the word symbol, symbolizes regeneration. That's R, regeneration. If no regeneration, then no share of the kingdom. The kingdom of God. It's really that simple. That's the deeper teaching of this parable. The washing of the feet represents a spiritual cleansing, regeneration, regeneration, cleansing at the new birth. Without it, one has no share, no place with Jesus in his kingdom with all his benefits. So while Jesus is teaching servanthood by washing the feet, he's also teaching that one must be cleansed by a work of God to share in the kingdom of God. One must be cleansed by a work of God before one can share in the kingdom of God. Let's look at a couple of verses on cleansing. I'll put two up here at the same time. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Spirit of our God. Titus 3, 5. Listen to this one. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is talking about that regeneration washing. If I don't wash you, he's teaching him a lesson. Then you don't share in the kingdom. Now let's talk about the kingdom and a share in it. We usually call this uh, our heirship or we are heirs. You know, an heir is someone who inherits something, right? Inherits, right? If we were to change the lettering up a little bit, it's someone who inherits something. So, basically, this is the idea. It's not spelt right. You've got to take out some of these vowels at this point. But the idea is that it's inheritance, okay? Inheritance. He becomes an heir when you are regenerated. And if you're not regenerated, you don't share as an heir. Listen to a couple of verses on this. Let's go to a new page. We'll look at them. Romans 8, 17 is our first one. And if children, heirs also. We're children of God. We're also heirs also. That is, heirs of God and heirs with Christ. Notice, with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope, to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance. You see? Inheritance. Which is perishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Notice who wrote the last one, Peter. By this time, Peter will understand it. This is after the, Jesus ascended and uh, after they received the Holy Spirit. Later on down the road, uh, in time, 
you will understand what Jesus was doing back there when he washed his feet. That Jesus was symbolizing regeneration. And that if he wasn't regenerated, which Peter was at the time, but now he's teaching how they all must not only serve one another, but also cleansing is necessary to have a share in the kingdom. So, now, not only does Jesus wash their feet, showing servanthood, but that one must be washed, regenerated, in order to be an heir of the kingdom. Pretty important lessons, huh? Well, Peter doesn't get it. Remember, it already, Jesus already said you're not going to understand all this. So what's Peter do? Uh, what's Peter do? He speaks up again. Verse nine. Simon Peter said to him, "Lord, then not only my feet, but wash also my hands and my head." Poor old Peter. He just doesn't get it. He misses the symbolism. Peter's thinking is if he needs his feet washed to get a share, then let's make sure and get my other body parts washed, my, heads, my head and my hands. Typically misunderstanding Jesus' words, which leads to misapplication. He's very enthusiastic about wanting to do the right thing, but he's enthusiastic here about doing the wrong thing. Now, sometimes enthusiasm can overwhelm one's thinking, and that's what's ha happening here. Uh, Peter doesn't get it. And it just shows us that he doesn't understand yet what Jesus is teaching. Well, Jesus attempts to clarify for him, verse 10. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed has no need to wash, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all. That means not all of the disciples. Now let me just tell you this, in some of your translations, your English translations, if you're trying to follow along, you probably have in your translation the words, his feet. So it says something like this. Jesus said to him, who, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. That his feet shouldn't be in your copy of scripture. It's not in the original writing. It doesn't make sense. Not only does it not make sense, you don't see it in the best text that we have, the best copy of the scripture. So, I mean in the Greek, the scripture, the original Greek, it's not there. So that's why I left it out when I translated this verse. He who has bathed has no need to wash, but is completely clean. What this is saying is, you don't need to wash again because you're already completely clean. So Jesus is answering Peter's comment about wanting to be cleaned more. Jesus said, no, you're already cleaned. Which is a way of saying you're already saved. You're already regenerated. You've already had that regenerational cleaning. But then he adds, and you are clean, but not all. You all, notice the plural, you all disciples are clean, but not all of you. Now, we had said in English, all of you are clean except one, or except someone. And that's what Jesus is saying. All the disciples are clean. They have the regenerational cleansing except one. And we know who that is, don't we? So, a couple of points off of this verse. Jesus is saying, if you've already been bathed, regeneration, cleansing, nothing else needs to be washed. Two, all the disciples have had a spiritual cleansing except one. There was only one among the disciples who was not clean, and that would be Judas. Now, Listen up. When Jesus said this verse, all right, let me get it back up here for you. 
he clarifies what he means by the washing. All right? When he says, one of you aren't washed, that symbolizes Judas still being an unbeliever. This clarifies the deeper meaning of the washing being regenerational cleansing and that all of them had been spiritually cleansed or saved, we might say, but the emphasis here is on the cleansing. But there's one who was not. So we know now that when Jesus is referring to washing the feet, it was symbolic of one being entirely cleaned, spiritually cleaned. John clarifies for us too in verse 11, for he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. Okay? And of course, we know now that he was referring to Judas. Let's look at some summary points as kind of review. At the same time, we do a summary going all the way back to verse 4 through verse 11. One, Jesus begins to clean the disciples' feet. That was in verses 4 and 5. Two, Peter begins to ask if Jesus is going to wash his two. Verse 6. Three, Jesus tells him what he does not understand now he will later. Referring to a time after, the, after Jesus' ascension and ascending of the Holy Spirit. That's in verse 7. Four, Peter protests that Jesus will never, ever wash his feet. A day. Five, Jesus responds that if he does not wash his feet, he has no share, no inheritance with him in the kingdom of God. 8b. Six, Peter misunderstands and then wants the Lord to wash his hands and head, thinking wrongly that this will better ensure him getting a share with Jesus. That's in verse 9. Seven, Jesus corrects him and says that if you have been bathed, now clearly representing spiritual cleansing, he has no need of further washing because he is completely clean. 10a. 8. Jesus says not all the disciples are clean, implying not all are spiritually clean. 9. John clarifies that Jesus was referring to the one who betrays him. We know now is Judas. So, let me... I'm not going to attempt to draw too much here. It's kind of hard for me to, to draw people. I'm not an artist, all right? But we have a person setting up here, right? We have his feet down here. Let's just kind of leave it like that, all right? I don't want to take too many chances here, all right? We'll give him some arms here, okay? So you have a person sitting here, and there's his feet. Jesus comes up and washes his feet. You know what that kind of be like? Now, this isn't quite like that, but let's say this is a disciple, right? We understand this is one of the disciples. Here comes Jesus, and he comes down here, and he's probably on his knees, and he's washing, he's washing this person's feet, all right? All right? So Jesus is washing their feet, all right? At the same time, he is the Lord. Can you think of somebody who you'd be shocked to do something like that for you? You might expect your parents to do it, especially if you're sick. They might help wash you, especially you're in bed and you can't wash yourself. But what if you're perfectly healthy and uh, you're sitting there and uh, let's say you're in a public school of some sort and the headmaster comes in and he says, I need to wash your feet. Or I need to tie your shoe. Let's say your shoe's untied. He notices and he bends down and he ties it for you. You wouldn't expect that from a headmaster, would you? You expect the headmaster to say, you need to tie your shoe for you trip and fall on your face right? But we have the Lord doing this for the disciples. So Peter has a hard time understanding this, right? But Jesus saying, washing your feet symbolizes that you're saved. 
Peter doesn't get it. Right? He says, well, then you wash my hand. You wash my head too. Jesus says, you don't need to be completely washed. You already bathed. You already clean. So this sparked an interesting conversation while Jesus was showing this servanthood, didn't it? So, anyway. Excuse the terrible drawing, but maybe I should just leave it up to your imagination. Verse 12. So when he, referring to Jesus, had washed their feet and taken his garments to put back on and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? Now we're going to let Jesus tell him what he's done. Verse 13. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for I am. So first of all, Jesus tells him, we all agree that you call me teacher and Lord, and I am your teacher and Lord. I'm your rabbi, I'm your master. Now, with them all in agreement that Jesus was their Lord and teacher, listen to verse 14. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. Now, this isn't hard. If your Lord and your master, your teacher, or they'd call him rabbi, is humbly and willing doing service to you, then you ought to be willing to do service for one another. In other words, the disciples should serve each other. Being a disciple means that you follow Jesus. And to follow Jesus means you also follow him in doing service for others. Now, of course, this carries over today to our day. Disciples serving disciples are believers serving believers. Believers in the church, believers around us, believers what we call in the body of Christ, the larger body of Christ, the worldwide universal church. Jesus is teaching all believers should serve one another. This is the design. Uh, this goes throughout the entire church around the world. Serving one another is part of a church family activity. One of the things that I enjoy is getting letters from those who uh, listen to the videos and appreciate the videos. and uh, Some of them support the ministry financially, and I certainly appreciate that. Um, I don't know what I would do without it. Uh, serving one another uh, in this way is a family, uh, church family activity. The use of our spiritual gifts are a large part for us serving the church family. One of the major ways in which we share as a body of Christ, we, we do a lot of things for each other as Christians. We serve each other. But one of the things I like to point out that when you serve one another, when you serve someone or you're served by someone, doesn't that deepen your fellowship with that person? Your love? your relationship, you learn more about them, what they're willing to do for you, and maybe what you're willing to do for them. So service, or we could call it servanthood, but let's just say service, helping each other, is a good example of sharing Sharing, fellowship, it's an example of humbly helping others. Jesus is teaching that we're to share. Let's write that very clear. Sharing with one another. 
there's no I there. I don't know why I put that there. I'm thinking of the ing. But we share by serving. All right? That's part of our fellowship as a church. Let me show you the next verse, which I think points out something that we need to understand. And we were trying to teach this here. For I have given you an example, this is verse 15, Jesus is speaking, for I have given you an example that just as I have done for you, you should do. Jesus is teaching an example, by an example, regarding serving one another, humbling, helping others. So should the disciple and the believer in Christ. Now let me tell you one thing this is not. There are some churches who like to practice foot washing. In fact, they make it part of their church denomination. That's a regular practice in the church. Jesus isn't teaching that that's a regular practice in the church. This is a one-time example of Jesus uh, teaching servanthood. It doesn't lend any support for the ritual some do in a church called foot washing. It was never authorized in the church from the scripture. And even we learned the writings of the, the early church after this, in the early writings of the church, they didn't practice foot washing either. Now, if you want to do it as an example of servanthood, that's fine, but it's so out of our culture to wash somebody else's feet. You know, if we see someone in need and something that should be done for them, uh, we help them. A uh, better idea would be if you see someone's feet dirty, you got to wonder, why don't they have shoes? Maybe you could buy them some shoes. All right. The point is, Jesus was teaching by example, service for one another. Verse 16, we, we shift gears just a little bit here. Jesus teaches another lesson. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than one who sent him. We have this familiar, truly, truly, I say to you. This is the absolute truth of the matter. Get ready to hear something that you need to learn, and that's true. First of all, a slave is not greater than his master. Now, everyone knew that. Right? Though Jesus has taught that the master also serves, which we just saw, he can serve others, the slave is not to think that he's above his master. He doesn't have to do what he's supposed to do as his slave or his servant. That still holds. Nor is one who was sent greater than the one who sent him. Neither should one be sent. Now in those days for one to be sent, it was usually on some sort of mission, whether it be in the military or uh, like we've seen God send Peter in, our, in Acts or send Paul. In his mission, or later on we'll see him send the disciples. Those who are sent are not greater than the one who sends them. That still holds true too. The one who sends is considered greater. But we all serve. Now the fact that Jesus talks about being sent, he's referred to himself being sent several times, hasn't he? That the Father sent him. But this also prepares the disciples in their thinking because they're soon going to be sent. So we don't change our roles just because we serve others, but we serve people in our role, right? Uh, some see me as a, as a pastor teacher, and that's exactly right. I am that, but I also serve them and I do that right now by serving them up this spiritual meal. I'm really serving you who are listening and learning. The final lesson in this section is in verse 17. And this is the one we need to pay attention to. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Pretty simple. If you know these things... And notice, if you do them, you're blessed. A blessed person is a person who's in a happy condition. You're doing what you know is right. 
You're doing God's will. You know you're pleasing Him. And He blesses you. And one of those blessings is that you have a good and happy attitude about you. You're doing God's will. How could it get any better than that? So to the disciples back then and to us today, we serve our Lord, our Master. We go where we're sent. And when we do those things, we are blessed. Final point. If you want to be blessed by God, serve where God sends you. If you want to be blessed by God, serve where God sends you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have set this all up so that we can serve one another. And in doing that, we're also serving you. And when we do these things, you bless us. And we thank you for that. Challenge us in the power of your spirit to properly apply these things in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name.